Praise be Jesus and Mary. We continue our discussion on the commandments today. Well, today we'll begin with the fifth commandment, which is uh, you shall not kill. Read that in Exodus 20, verse 13. The Catechism speaks about this commandment in paragraphs 2258 through 2330, and it divides the topics covered into three specific fields. So respect for human life, respect for the dignity of persons, and safeguarding peace. The overlying principle of the fifth commandment is that human life is sacred. Paragraph 2258 says, God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning till its end. No one can under any circumstance claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being, unquote. So the fifth commandment forbids playing God. It forbids all unjust killing either of others or oneself. It also forbids all unjust wounding or mutilation. At the same time, it commands proper care of oneself and of others as well. As a side note, generally speaking, there are two great classes of injustices. One is taking someone's goods, the other is damaging the goods or the rights of the other. In this case, it would be damaging their life in some way. Injury or injustice, it's actually a mortal sin. It's a mortal sin ex genere suo, as the Latin says. That means that per se, it's a grave sin, but it might become venial if the things stolen or the damage done is negligible. Catechism at number 2261 says, Scripture specifies the prohibition contained in the fifth commandment. Do not slay the innocent and the righteous. Exodus 23, verse 7. So deliberate murder of an innocent person is gravely contrary to the dignity of the human being, to the golden rule, and to the holiness of of the Creator. The law forbidding it is universally valid, so it obliges each and every one, always and everywhere, says the Catechism, quoting there. And we know that the Lord on the Sermon on the Mount even extends this command to include things like anger and hatred and vengeance. Those can be spiritual forms of killing. We'll look at those a little later on in our reflections. So. When someone comes into the confessional and they say, Father, I've never killed anyone, sometimes you'll hear that, right? Uh, you should ask, well, have you ever been angry towards someone? Or have hatred, to have, had, have you had hatred towards someone? Or wished vengeance on someone? If so, maybe you're not as innocent as you think. Not, not quite as innocent as we think sometimes. Under respect for human life, the Catechism speaks of legitimate defense, intentional homicide, abortion, euthanasia, and suicide. We'll take a look at each of these. First, legitimate defense. Catechism at 22, 64 paragraph says, love toward oneself remains a fundamental principle of morality towards yourself. Therefore, it's legitimate to insist on respect for one's own right to life. Someone who defends his life is not guilty of murder, even if he's forced to deal his aggressor a lethal blow, unquote. Much of the material I think covered here is basically common sense, including the laws governing legitimate defense. Normally there are three conditions required for self-defense to be licit, for it to be okay. One, you're dealing with an aggressor who's effectively unjust, so they're really doing something unjust. Two, you need to try to use the minimal, indispensable violence necessary to repel the aggression. So excessive force would be sinful. I'm sure at times in the moment when you're dealing with someone like that, it's difficult to judge what can be excessive and what isn't excessive, but the principle should be kept in mind. Three, that the damage done is proportionate to the good defended. So for example, breaking someone's arm because they tried to steal a candy, candy bar from you would in general be considered disproportionate, right? Not quite proportionate in the right way. Paragraph 2265 says it takes legitimate defense even a step further. It says legitimate defense can be not only a right but a grave duty for one who's responsible for the lives of others. So for example, if you're a father or a mother, you have the duty to protect your children from harm and from perpetrators as well. 
The defense of the common good, says the Catechism, requires that an unjust aggressor be rendered unable to cause harm. For this reason, those who legitimately hold authority also have the right to use arms to repel aggressors against the civil community entrusted to their responsibility, unquote. So example, for example, defunding the police or making it extremely difficult for them to do their duty would not only be against common sense, it would also be against the common good as well. Catechism at paragraph 2266 says that legitimate public authority has the right and duty to inflict punishment proportionate to the gravity of the offense. And punishment has two aims. One is to correct the disorder that was introduced by the offense. Two is also for the correction of the guilty party himself when possible. So if the offender willingly accepts their punishment, it actually has the value of expiation for them. So in a way, it's, it can be a way for them of atoning for their sins. The next paragraph in the Catechism deals with the death penalty, paragraph 22. 67, it's recently been changed to exclude the possibility of having recourse to the death penalty. I think when the catechism first came out, it excluded the death penalty, then the next edition included it, now it's excluding it. So it's going back and forth on this. It would probably be, require a bit of a discussion here, but we'll, we'll leave that out uh, for this reflection. Regarding homicide, the fifth commandment forbids, quote, direct and intentional killing as gravely sinful. That's paragraph 22, 68. So the murderer and those who cooperate voluntarily in murder commit a sin that cries out to heaven for vengeance. Paragraph 22, 69 adds the fifth commandment also forbids anything with the intention of indirectly bringing about a person's death. The moral law also prohibits exposing someone to mortal danger without grave reason, as well as refusing assistance to a person in danger, unquote. That's all pretty much common sense when you think about it. Paragraph 2268 says, unintentional killing is not morally imputable, so you're not guilty for it, but one is not exonerated from grave offense if without proportionate reasons he has acted in a way that brings about someone's death even without the intention of doing so." Unquote. So again, even self-defense requires a certain amount of self-control. Sometimes it may lead to the death of the other person, but that should be avoided on our part when possible. As a side note here, thou shalt not kill, it refers specifically to human beings, this fifth commandment. However, causing animals unnecessary suffering is actually also sinful. It's venially sinful. It could be seriously sinful if there's a sadistic gratification attached to it or if the brutality shown towards the animals actually brutalizes us, right? So if it makes us more disrespectful towards life in general, it could be a serious sin in that case. That being said, animals are meant to serve man so they, can, so they can be used for any ethical purpose. And we can have compassion towards animals, yes, but to have more compassion for animals than for people is a sign that there's something spiritually wrong with us, not quite right with us on the spiritual side. It's something to pray about and maybe even seek help for if we have struggle with that. The Catechism in paragraphs 2270 through 2275 speak of the evil of abortion. Paragraph 2271 says, Since the first century, the Church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. So you read that in the Didache, for example. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortion, that is to say, abortion willed either as an end or a means, is gravely contrary to the moral law, unquote. And the penalty of excommunication is attached to abortion as well. That includes the mother who consented to the abortion, includes the abortion doctor and their assistants, it includes the necessary accomplices as well, meaning, meaning those who, whose efforts were instrumental in perpetuating the crime and in causing the abortion. Why is excommunication attached to the sin of the abor abortion? Because as Catechism, paragraph 2272 says, it makes clear the gravity of the crime committed 
the irreparable harm done to the innocent who's put to death, as well as to the parents and the whole of society." Unquote. And there's talk in our country of giving reparations to African Americans because of slavery in the past, and some, ple some places are actually doing that as well. Question, you know, what reparations can you make to a child that's been aborted? Actually, none. Can't do that. No reparation can actually help you with that. That's another reason why abortion is far worse than slavery. The power to give sacramental absolution for the sin of abortion used to be limited to the bishop and to uh, special confessors. Since 2016, thanks to Pope Francis, all priests have that power. So it's actually a good thing. That being said, those who've received God's forgiveness for this sin, sometimes you need to learn to forgive yourself as well, as hard as that is as hard as that can be. You know, if God forgives you, you need to learn to forgive you. Basic rule of forgiveness. And we have to ask him for help if we struggle with that, for this sin or for any other sins that we've committed. John Paul II in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae says that the intentional or experim experimentation on human intervention or experimentation on human embryos which inevitably involves the killing as well as the abandonment of embryos formed in vitro and the use of embryos or live fetuses as furnacers of tissues or organs to be transplanted. You can guess all that has the same moral value of abortion. All of it is seriously sinful stuff. You can't experiment on embryos in that way. Catechism says at paragraph 2275, though, it says one may hold as licit, so it's acceptable, procedures carried out on the human embryo which respect the life and integrity of the embryo and do not involve disproportionate risks for it, but are directed towards its healing, the improvement of its condition of health, or its individual survival. Unquote. That's pretty commonsensical again, right? Whatever is done to the embryo to preserve or save or better its life is licit. However, you always have to treat the embryo as a human person because it is. However, the same paragraph says, certain attempts to influence chromosomic or genetic inheritance are not therapeutic, but are aimed at producing human beings selected according to sex or other predetermined qualities such manipulations are contrary to the personal dignity of the human being and his integrity and identity, which are unique and unrepeatable." Unquote. So it's immoral to try to create designer babies, for example. You can't do that. That's immoral. In our next reflection, we'll continue looking at the do's and don'ts of the fifth commandment. Let's ask Our Lady, the mother of life, the mother of all the living, for the grace to see life really as a sacred gift from God, worthy of being protected and defended at all times and at all stages as well. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.